So what we're discussing is the political basis for the Books Not Bombs campaign that we want to run from the autumn. And what I want to try and cover now is four things. One is what are the main features of world relations today in general uh, and the relations between the imperialist powers. Number two is where does Britain fit into that? Number three is why is militarism on the rise at the moment? And number four is how we can fight imperialism and militarism. So this will assume a certain amount of knowledge. I'm not going to go through what Lenin says in imperialism, for example. Uh, it will assume certain things. But I'll mention at certain points, this is where this is to understand this particular point a bit more. You should read this text. I'll mention that as we go through. I won't be able to go through it all now. Last month, the, the, there was a new head of the British Army. And he said that Britain should prepare for war within the next three years. And specifically, he talked about Russia, China and Iran. And why was he saying that? Well, because the world situation in general is characterized at the moment by sharpening and increasing conflict. I think we can all see that that's the case. And you can read more about that, actually, in the Manifesto of the Revolutionary Communist International, which we probably have on the stall over there. Now, why is that the case? Why are we living through a period of sharpening conflict? It's because there is an underlying economic crisis, an underlying world economic crisis. And again, I don't have, that, I don't have time to develop that fully. And for that, we need to, we need to study Marxist economics uh, and understand why capitalism goes into crisis. And that crisis really, it came to the surface in 2008. Very clearly at that time as a crisis of overproduction. Since then, the character of the crisis has, that underlying crisis, that underlying overproduction has been there since that time. But since then, you've seen, for example, things like the pandemic, its own kind of economic crisis, the inflation that came after. Inflation, of course, actually does not, it doesn't have the characteristics of a crisis of overproduction. Overproduction is where the market, there's more being produced than the market can profitably absorb. With the, uh, with the, the inflationary situation and with the, the bottlenecks, the uh, supply chain problems that were created by the pandemic, actually the issue is that there's not enough goods. They want more, there's more of a market, but they can't get hold of them because there's bottlenecks in the supply chains and so on. That's all within the context of a crisis of overproduction. But nevertheless, it looks slightly different. Anyway, I don't have time to go into all of that. These are, these are discussions that we need to have about the, the world economic situation another time, and that should be had in the branches. The, the main point is this. There has been, since 2008, a, an existing and deepening economic crisis for that whole period of time. Uh, yeah, with some ebbs and flows, but basically the picture has been bleak and getting worse. And crucially, no matter what form the crisis takes in any given moment, None of it is just a mistake. None of it is capitalism gone wrong. It's all linked entirely to the logic of the capitalist system and its internal contradictions. And, and that crisis continues now. I mean, the World Bank said, for example, back in January of this year, that the first half of the 2020s, so 2020 to 25, is the weakest five years, the weakest half decade of performance for the global economy for the last 30 years. So that cri the crisis is bad and it's deepening and it's continuing. That is important to understand because the result is therefore inevitably a conflict over markets. When there's not enough to go around for the capitalists, not enough markets, not enough areas they can make profit for, they will fight over what, what little there is. And this obviously in a, in a really extremely basic uh, uh, way is, is an understanding of imperialism for which to properly understand the comrades need to read Lenin's book. Obviously, companies themselves, capitalist big multinational companies, can fight for those markets themselves with uh, market manipulation, price cutting, trying to bankrupt other companies and so on. But their most powerful weapon is actually the state. It's the national state in the country of their origin. That state can pursue that, those, those battles on, the, on behalf of the big capitalists. The state, and here the comrades should read State and Revolution by Lenin, the state is a weapon of the ruling class, of the capitalist class. And it can do things like impose tariff barriers and taxes. Uh, it can use diplomacy. It can use war, diplomacy to open up new markets, war to conquer new markets. 
And this has been the trend ever since 2008. More protectionism, more economic nationalism, and states operating on behalf of the big capitalists trying to defend their national bourgeoisie. That general trend of economic nationalism, protectionism, and conflict is a crucial thing to understand about the world today. There'll be ebbs and flows, there'll be small changes in local, but in the general trend for the last 15 years or so has been in that direction, and it is picking up and continuing. This is the, the basic thing to understand about why the world is seeing increasing conflict. However, it's important not to just reduce imperialism and conflict and war just to purely economic questions. That would be, that's the kind of reductionism that we talked about, that Keelan spoke about, for example, in the discussion on history earlier today for those comrades who are present for that, which we do not uh, do. We don't adopt that method. That's not what Marxists are about. Sometimes states do imperialist things for non-economic reasons or not directly economic reasons. I'll give you an example in Ukraine and what the US is doing, for example, in backing Ukraine in, as a proxy against Russia. Now, there is a direct economic benefit to the United States from this in that by breaking Europe away from Russian gas, dependence on Russian gas, for example, they are bringing it into the sphere of the US and its exports of LNG and things like this. That's a direct economic benefit to, uh, uh, to the US. It's winning Europe away from Russia's sphere of influence and into its own. Yeah, but that is probably the set, well, definitely the secondary element of the war in Ukraine. That's not the main thing that they're doing. The main thing they're doing is trying to contain Russia. And in trying to contain Russia, also assert their dominance generally globally. They've also got one eye on Taiwan and what China is looking at. If Russia can get away with this in Ukraine, they're thinking, then China will try and get away with this in Taiwan. And this is in the context of them being, being humiliated in Afghanistan and pushed out uh, in, a, in a kind of a haphazard way. The US is thinking in those terms, in geopolitical, geostrategic kind of terms, not directly, purely in economic terms. And to be able to understand those kind of questions is also very important to understand why and how imperialism operates today. But another trend in world relations at the moment is the, is the relative decline of US imperialism. We must emphasize that point about relative decline. US GDP uh, is $29 trillion and China is second with $19 trillion and the UK is $3.5 trillion in, in GDP. So the US is still by far the largest, most powerful economy. It spends more on defense than every, almost everybody else combined. It is still by far the most dominant imperialist power on the planet. But it has had a relative decline since 2008 especially. It has been pushed back on a number of fronts. Uh, it, it was trying to bring Georgia, for example, at that time in 2008 into NATO and Russia set in this right on Russia's borders and Russia said, no, we're not having that. And they invaded and pushed it back and prevented that happening. In 2011, all of, its, all of the US allies in the Middle East, in the Arab world, were all overthrown one by one by these mass movements and they were completely unable to intervene to, to protect them. And then that, you know, what happened in Syria, what happened in Libya, where it descended into war, civil war, proxy wars. Russia was able to intervene quite decisively in that situation in 2011, and the US was not able to. Ukraine, in 2014, so this battle in Ukraine, this conflict in Ukraine has been going on since 2014. And back in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea, and there was nothing the US could do about it. And then now, there is this proxy war going on and Russia is making gains uh, and, and is threatening, threatening NATO with a complete humiliation. And I mentioned Afghanistan already. You see this whole number, this whole range of areas where previously the US was able to assert its dominance and now it is being pushed back. It is unable to be the, the force that it once was and assert its will in every single region at the same time uh, in the way that it used to. It's a very expensive thing to be the world's policeman at this point in time, and there is a big economic crisis on, and it's not good to be spending lots of money on anything from a ruling class point of view. And then you've got other powers that are rising, uh, Russia, China, and so on. That's, on a, that's at the global, and, and regionally you have the same thing. With Russia and China comes conflicts and basically a hedging of bets by the smaller nations, Turkey, Saudi Arabia. They try and play these countries off against each other. Um, <clears throat> I don't have time to go into all of this, but again, if the comrades haven't read it, there was a document written in 2016 by the International, 
We republished it fairly recently on Marxist.com. It's called something like On the Imperialist Character of Russia and China. I can't remember the exact title, but you should find it on Marxist.com and read it. And it's all about how new imperialist powers arise and the resulting impact on world relations. Because what it creates is, and it's an argument actually also against this idea of multipolarity as a progressive thing. This is what Stalinists argue. They say, well, it's a good thing that Russia and, that Russia and China are becoming stronger and fighting the US because then you have, instead of a unipolar world with the US as dominant, you have this uh, multipolar world, and that in some way is better. And that's not the case. We don't agree with that. It's not, it actually creates more instability and conflict and all the rest of it. We're not in favor. We don't fight imperialism with a different kind of imperialism. We fight imperialism with working class struggle. Um, anyway, th this document is useful from that point of view, and comrades should read it. The point is that that trend is not temporary and it's not uh, going away anytime soon, that is only going to intensify. So this is another key thing to understand about the, the world, the, the situation with world relations. In, any, in another period, in a past period, there probably would have, well, I think we can say there definitely would have been a world war by this point, by which I mean a direct clash between the imperialist powers, a direct clash between Russia and the US or China and the US or something like this. That is ruled out at this point by the class balance of forces. The working class, as we know, war is the midwife to revolution. And I mean, you can imagine now if the United States said, we're going to launch nuclear missiles against Russia, obviously Russia is going to launch them back and probably a good number of our cities will be wiped out, millions of people are going to die. But that's it. People would not have that. They wouldn't say, oh yeah, all right, that sounds like a good policy. We'll vote for that. We'll be in favor of that. There would immediately be uh, revolt and revolution. The class balance of forces rules out, and the, and the existence of nuclear weapons rules out that kind of conflict, at least in the, in the short and medium uh, term. Um, <clears throat> and so instead, you get proxy wars, still very violent and vicious, like in Ukraine, for example. You get proxy wars uh, developing, and that increase in militarism is still there. It's just not expressed in the form of a world war and a direct clash between the imperialist powers. This is the general world situation. And the important thing to understand is that it's not, uh, it's not going away. All of that is going to intensify in the coming period. Where does Britain fit into all of this? Well, I mean, what, what are Britain's global interests? What interests? We're not reductionists, but you've got to start with what are Britain's economic interests globally? What does it care about? Where are its strategic investments? Where do, the, where do the British imperialists think, yeah, we've got to defend our interests here and we're not so worried about over there or whatever it is? Well, Britain's main economic interests in general are services. 81% of British GDP is, uh, is produced by the service economy. It's the second largest exporter of services in the world. It's the financial center of, of the world. It's the largest exporter of insurance, in particular insurance services, uh, anywhere in the world. This is a very different Britain to the workshop of the world 200 years ago. And that dominance of the British Empire was based on manufacturing. Since then, the British capitalists have not invested in manufacturing, especially since the end of the Second World War, although before that as well. And they've looked for, for quicker profits, making money out of money, instead of having to go through the bother of actually producing things, just invest the money and then take, some, take a larger pot of money back out again. And this, as Cal was saying, is why a comrade should read Trotsky's writings on Britain, because he, he illustrates some of these points. He starts to pick up on these uh, tendencies and these trends in, uh, in Britain. But the result is that this year, uh, Britain, the UK, slipped to, to 12th. It's the 12th largest manufacturing nation in the world. It's now manufactures less than Mexico, manufactures less than, uh, than Russia. Um, <clears throat> And even then, what manufacturing there is in Britain is not done by the British capitalists. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's mainly done by, by foreign capitalists that come to Britain and invest money and set up their companies here. For example, cars are Britain's largest manufacturing export. And the top 10 car companies operating in the UK are all, they have 60% of the market between them, so uh, uh, a monopoly. And they are all foreign owned. Uh, and the, I think the, uh, the largest number is, is Germ uh, are German companies. Most of British industry has been sold off or bought up in that way. The war, like water companies, for example, infrastructure like that, 70% of British water companies are foreign owned. 
You think of big names like Cadbury, for example, sold to Kraft, a US multinational in 2010, and they immediately moved all the Cadbury factories out of uh, the UK. One of the largest British companies, a tech company, makes semiconductors, a key strategic uh, industry. Uh, it's called ARM or ARM Holdings. Um, and they are now, as of 2017, that's owned by a Japanese bank, SoftBank. Gatwick is owned by a French multinational. Uh, Heathrow is owned by a Spanish multinational. Actually, well, soon to be a Saudi, uh, Saudi company, actually. The ports in Liverpool, Glasgow, Great Yarmouth. Um, are all owned by Deutsche Bank. The port in Felixstowe is owned by a company in Hong Kong. The nuclear power in this country is owned by the French uh, government, or the French energy company EDF, which is a nationalized French company. So all of the manufacturing, all the industry that does take place, which is not much, 10% of GDP or a bit less than, uh, nevertheless is done by foreign companies. The British capitalists don't bother basically with that. The British capitalists do still need, they rely on manufacturing and industry. They just don't have it in this country. So AstraZeneca, the pharmaceutical company, is the largest, by market capitalization, the largest British company. And it has 28 manufacturing plants, of which two are in the UK, and the rest are somewhere else. They basically export their capital somewhere else and do the manufacturing process uh, elsewhere. BP, another one of the major, one of the largest British companies, obviously has most of its production, most of its capital investment is abroad. It's in LNG plants in Trinidad and Tobago or, or, or offshore, oil, offshore oil in, in Angola or wherever. British American Tobacco, another major British company. Um, it closed its last factory in the UK in 2007. It's now it's still opening factories all over the world. This year, they've opened one in Romania, in South Korea. But they're, what they have in, in fact, on that site in Southampton, that, that former factory, that former cigarette factory in Southampton is now a, a research center. So what they do instead is produce services basically in this country and the manufacturing is done somewhere else. Unilever is the same thing. They have massive investment export of capital abroad uh, in infrastructure, in industry. They own, like, Unilever owns the Greek ice cream distribution uh, infrastructure, water purification in China, uh, a, big, a big chunk of that is done by Unilever. Production lines for beauty and health products in Denmark, Unilever owns all of that and so on. The point is the British capitalists export their capital and, and put their manufacturing abroad because it's quicker and cheaper uh, to make money uh, by doing that. There's cheaper labor and there's better skilling in other countries. And to turn the UK into that would require a lot of time and investment and energy, which doesn't make sense for the individual capitalists to waste their time doing that, investing in that way in Britain. So they export their capital uh, all over the world in order to do that. So that's one of one element of the UK's economic interests. Another, like globally speaking, another element of the UK's economic interests is services. So this is the main the main pillar of the UK economy. And obviously a service economy is a rentier economy. It doesn't produce stuff. It provides services to companies and countries that do actually produce stuff. Um, the retail services or the consulting services, or the advertising or the legal or the financial, just the investment in order to do this. And this is a weaker basis for an economy than manufacturing. And that's why Britain is uh, today, the UK is the sixth largest economy. It was recently overtaken by India. Uh, and uh, so it slipped into the sixth largest economy in the world today. But as I said earlier, it's the second largest exporter of services, and those services go everywhere. HSBC, one of the largest, one of the top 10 British companies, um, <clears throat> it's mainly focused and is increasingly focused on Asia and markets in Asia. In almost every country in Asia, HSBC is investing. Prudential, major insurance company, has $250 billion worth of assets, again, in Asia. Lloyd's, like Lloyd's of London, not the, but like the, the insurance market in London, is seeing massive increases in investment uh, through London, but in Latin America, for example, at the moment. Britain's main business model today is to be a good servant to... Uh, other more powerful imperialists or big companies or imperialist powers that want to invest their money elsewhere. Um, 
if we take insurance as an example, it is, it's 25% of the GDP of, of London is, comes from service activity, like, for, sorry, from insurance services in particular. So London is the only city in the world with the top 20 insurance companies all have a base. So this is their main, this is one of the things they pride themselves on. Um, and it's, I mean, insurance, I've, I was reading a bit of, I won't bore you with all the details of insurance. I mentioned this to a comrade the other day and they said it sounded terribly boring, but I found it fascinating. <laughs> Um, but they, they describe insurance as the DNA of capitalism. This is what allow, this is what gives the com, the, um, the comrades, the, the capitalists, the, uh, the confidence to invest in things because we're not talking house insurance here or car insurance or anything like that. We're talking insurance for major, for, for investment, basically. A capitalist comes and says, I want to invest hundreds of millions in this country. Will you, company in London or Lloyd's of London, which is like the insurance kind of market, the trading bit of the insurance uh, business, Will you insure this massive investment? Otherwise, I'm not going to make it. So it's the, it's the lubricant, basically. That's why they describe it as the DNA of capitalism. There's a company called Aon. It's one of the largest insurance companies in the world. And Aon, in I think it was 2012, maybe. Uh, or maybe it was more recent than that. Anyway, it moved its headquarters from Chicago to London. Didn't do anything. It just moved basically 12 executives to London, and that was it. But it registered in the UK basically for tax reasons. I could also tell you about exactly that, that tax setup, why London is, is the best place for these kind of company. I won't do it, but that is what, that's why they moved to London. It was for tax purposes. The point is that the British state has built the perfect machine for greasing the wheels of the export of capital. It is an incubator. London and the city of London and all these insurance companies and everything is an incubator for, the, for imperialism, for the export of capital all around the world. That's its business model. That's what it aims to do. That's what it aims to be, a good butler, a good servant to these companies, these capitalists that want to invest all over the world and want to ensure their risk all over the world and everything else. And they will defend that. that this is why Liz Truss was forced out, because Liz Truss's policies, her unfunded tax cuts and everything else, basically sent the market into a bit of a jitter and people stopped investing. People started betting against the pound, started saying Britain's not going to be able to pay its debts. And people stopped, the money stopped, people were threatening basically, the investors threatened to stop putting money through London. And that would have tanked the entire British economy. That would, that would be the end of it. And so they got rid of her um, <clears throat> because they have to defend that. The British state has to defend that to the death. And all the British capitalists ask for in, in return is a kind of a, a bit off the top. Uh, Bring your money through London, use our tax havens and everything else, and just give us a little bit of rent off that. Like just for, uh, we'll insure the risk and we'll take a little bit of a cut. Or um, <clears throat> use our, like London has a lot of financial tech, like fintech services, for example. Use our financial tech uh, to basically help you export this capital and we'll just take a little cut. It's, it's a parasite. It's, parasite. It's, it's business model is bring all this money through London, funnel it all through, and we'll just be a little bit parasitic on it and just take a little bit off the top. Um, yeah, I have some more facts and figures, but we'll skip over this. Uh, the result is this, that the way to see and understand the UK and especially London, it is a hub of global imperialism. It's, it is a very key fundamental link in that chain of Western imperialism, basically. So we mustn't forget that. Because we can talk about the, the decline and the weakness of British capitalism and British imperialism, and we should. It's what we refer to as the special crisis of British capitalism. Um, in that it's, it's abandoned its manufacturing, it's no longer the, the, it no longer has the empire that it once did, and now it's this kind of second-rate power, smaller economy than India, and is servant to the other imperialist powers. Yeah, it is weak. But nevertheless, it is actually a major imperial, it's a major player in the in the imperialist world it, and the British capitalist class plays a crucial function in that it is not weak. It's not like they have no interests, uh, imperialist interests or, or an interest in promoting imperialism. They do. And we mustn't kid ourselves. We need to understand the relative decline of British capitalism in order to understand the psychology and, and the consciousness, both of the ruling class and of the working class. But also we need to understand it is not nothing. It's not some, some weak, pathetic imperialist power. It plays a major role in all of this. Obviously, this business model means that the British capitalists don't really care where the money has come from or where it's going. They are just coupon clippers. They're just skimming off the top. They don't care. As long as it's money, as long as it's there, they're not bothered. They want to be open to everybody. Bring your money to London. 
doesn't matter who you are, bring your money to London and we'll take a, a bit off the top. And also they want to be very open so that the British capitalists who don't want to invest in manufacturing in Britain can export their capital freely and easily and cheaply to like people like AstraZeneca. They want them to be able to set up their 26 manufacturing plants around the world as easily as possible. They just want to be open. That's all the British capital. They just want to be as open as possible uh, and bring the money in and let the money flow out again. And so they do bring in money from absolutely everywhere. 27 billion pounds worth uh, of, of Russian money is invested in the UK. And it's so tied up, there was a report in 2020 from an um, intelligence services committee in, in the House of Commons that said that the, or maybe it was 2022, it said that the amount, the, the, rush, the 27 billion of Russian money in London is so, I can't remember the exact words they use, but it's basically so tied up with British business and commerce and finance that it cannot be untangled. This report just says it's just that, it's just a uh, mitigation basically now. We can't fully untangle this. They're completely embedded. There's 970 Chinese companies that operate in Britain. They generated a revenue last year of 116.4 billion pounds. Uh, so, but this, they're perfectly happy with that yet. Yeah, bring all these, all these billions to, to the UK. 40 billion from Qatar is sloshing around the country, again, mainly in London. 21 billion from Saudi Arabia. They don't care where the money comes from. They're just open for business as much as possible. Obviously, in such a situation, the largest uh, power in the world is the United States, and the United States has vast amounts invested. I just gave you some figures, 27 billion in Russia, or from Russia rather, 40 billion from Qatar. The US has 676 billion invested in the UK, and it represents a third, a full third of all the foreign money that is invested in the UK comes from the United States. It's the same amount as comes from the EU in total. Uh, so it has about the same say over, over things um, <clears throat> as the EU does. And trade with the US between Britain and the US is worth 310 billion a year. There's all kinds of other statistics you could give, but again, the point I'm trying to get out here is that Britain is tied extremely closely to the United States. Obviously, historically, socially, like linguistically, um, but also crucially, um, economically. But also, clearly, it is very much the junior partner in that. Britain is very much the junior partner in that relationship. Um, <clears throat> it's dependent on the US, yes, economically. If the US were to withdraw 676 billion from the UK economy, that would sink the economy, no doubt about that. Um, <clears throat> but also militarily, to defend its interests abroad. The US is the foremost imperialist power. Yeah, Britain has interests all over the world. It has you know, one company, Prudential, 250 billion of assets in, in Asia, as if the British state can defend 250 billion worth of assets in Asia. Of course it can't, its military is not capable of that. So it needs to rely on alliances with the US, for example, uh, to defend its interests. I mean, you can even take the, it, look, Britain has about, I think trade with Israel between the UK and Israel is about, worth about six billion a year, six billion pounds a year. That's not that much in the, in the grand scheme of things, but it's also, a, there's a lot of tech trading that goes on Israel is a bit of a hub for investment in the rest of the region, so British capitalists can put their money there and then it can go elsewhere in the region. There are some interests to defend, obviously. Britain is not going to be able to defend those interests. It can't defend those interests in Israel. It relies on the United States to defend those, those interests, and therefore it is tied into supporting US imperialism in that region. Again, it's not, all, it's not just about the economic questions there. Uh, there's, other, there's other factors at play, um, but... This is just an example. The, the, the point I'm trying to make is like, yeah, they're tied economically to it, but Britain also wants the, the, the military protection of the United States. Um, <clears throat> and it becomes this, a link in this chain of US imperialism, uh, which, which spreads obviously across the world and, it, and, and this kind of lapdog to the US. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've got a few examples here, which I won't go through, of, of how this manifests itself in practice. I will give one example of, of which I think sums up the relationship and the, and the role that Britain plays in this kind of chain of Western imperialism. So this insurance company that I mentioned, Aon, that moved its headquarters to London, it just earlier this year, it announced that it is underwriting a scheme, is, is providing insurance, basically, underwriting a scheme for $350 million worth of investment in Ukraine for the rebuilding of Ukraine after the war. And it has partnered with a US government agency basically to do this. Uh, so what, what that is, is um, 
Aon, like the capital, the capitalists providing the capital, Aon providing the capital, London providing a quick and easy and cheap way of exporting that capital, and Washington deciding where that capital actually gets exported to. That's the relationship. That's the 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 way in which Washington, London, Britain is part of this of this U.S. Uh, this chain of U.S. imperialism. So the result is not much independent foreign policy for the UK. It doesn't, it doesn't, it can't really do much that is against the interests of the United States in broad terms. Clearly that is the case on the big stuff like Ukraine, uh, Israel, the Iraq war. Um, <clears throat> but there's, there's all kinds of examples of that. For example, um, there's this uh, a new trans or relatively new trans-Pacific trade partnership uh, that includes a lot of Asian countries and, and Canada also, I think. And Britain has lobbied for some time and has now been successful. The UK has been successful in getting into that and becoming a member of that free trade agreement, basically, between these nations that border the Pacific. It will make almost no difference to UK GDP. I think the, the projected increase in UK GDP that will come from being part of this free trade agreement is about 0.2%. It's worthless from the point of view of, of like British capitalism in directly economic uh, terms. But neither China nor the US are part of this free trade deal, although both are quite interested in joining. All of these countries, Vietnam and so on, all these Asia, they do they, they balance between the US and China. They trade with both and they would like to continue trading with both. So they're trying to, they'll never let the US in because they border China. They're not that stupid. They're not going to antagonize China in that way. And, and the US is a bit worried that they might let China in. So the US now has Britain in there, and Britain will definitely stop China ever joining. It's, 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 it's doing the job. It's, it's not really its own foreign policy. It's doing US foreign policy on, on behalf of the White House. Um, <clears throat> and this is important to understand. Now, there is obviously a, a slight uh, tension here. There are, there's nuance and there's um, caveats, because the US has certain strategic interests, markets it wants to export its capital into it's not it's not entirely like the uk where it's just we're, we're just we don't really care we'll just take money from anyone we're not that fussed russians chinese yeah just all bring your money and your investment over here they don't really the us doesn't have that policy um <clears throat> the uk obviously doesn't want from an economic point of view it doesn't want to make an enemy out of russia doesn't want to particularly it has no particular interest in making an enemy out of china but the us does have that the US does have that kind of conflict going on, does have an interest in that kind of conflict. And the UK is tied to the US. So there's a, there's a tension there between uh, these, these, these different powers pulling in different directions. Um, <clears throat> uh, and so, for example, when Sunak was still the prime minister earlier this year, he went to the US and Biden said, stop bringing Chinese money into Britain. Stop bringing Chinese money through London. And Sunak said, OK, yeah, yeah, I will. Don't worry about that. And then he went home and there was this joint letter by, by, chief, by uh, I, don't, I can't remember who, but British capitalists basically saying, we, it, ba <laughs> it basically said quite openly, we understand why you have to say that to Biden, but can you just implement it really, really slowly? Um, <laughs> because it will disrupt us too much. So there's a, you can see the kind of tension that exists there, basically. Um, <clears throat> And there's tensions also in, the, in this kind of relationship that are caused by internal domestic questions as well. And, and foreign policy can be affected by that. And like, look, the, 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 it was the internal dynamics of the Tory party that led to Brexit. <clears throat> that was not in the interests of British capitalism who want to be as open as possible uh, for the most part. They want to be able to export their capital. They don't want more tariff barriers and so on. It was an act, Brexit was an act of economic self-harm. And yet it was the product of, the, of, of nothing to do with uh, with the interests of British imperialism and entirely to do with, with the interests of, of factions in the Tory party. That also upset the Americans who want Britain to be part of the EU uh, and so on. And, and look, Boris Johnson's attitude to the Ukraine war. Yeah, the US obviously is in favor of the war in Ukraine, but Johnson went even further in his support for Ukraine than what the Americans did. But that was because of Johnson's own internal trouble in the Tory, that he had Partygate going on at the time. He needed a bit of a distraction and model himself as Churchill. It was purely internal stuff, nothing to do with the interests of British imperialism, and yet it affected things in that way. Uh, and you, you could even say that like, Starmer is, is, is taking a certain attitude towards Gaza and talking about, oh, yeah, he's talked about, hasn't recognizing Palestine, making noises that are different to the Tory party. 
uh, partly because he's under enormous pressure. In turn, it's nothing to do, again, with the interest, of, it's slightly to do with the interest of British influence, but it's not really anything to do with that. Uh, and it's much more like internal dynamics. The point is, again, not everything is completely mechanical. When you're looking at the actions of the British government and its imperialist policies and what it's doing, it's not entirely, you can't draw a line and say, well, that's because this insurance company has told the British government to do that. It's not, it's not exactly in, in that way. But in general, what we need to understand is British imperialism as a junior partner to the US and a link in, in that chain of Western imperialism. And certain things flow from that then, uh, which is specifically that Britain has to prove itself a useful link in that chain beyond purely economic questions. It has to prove itself militarily. And this is especially the case from the point of view of the US today, which has a lot of conflicts on its plates, growing number of conflicts. We discussed that earlier, the situation with world relations. Um, and this is only going to increase. And so it's very important for the US. That it has loyal servants around it, basically, and well-armed servants around it because it's going to need the help. For example, having loyal servants on the Security Council of the United Nations. Um, now, to be at which Britain currently is, and obviously uh, Russia is also there, they need, and China, they need, the US needs allies. But to be on the Security Council, you have to have nuclear weapons. And therefore, Britain has to spend hundreds of billions of pounds on nuclear weapons because that's what US imperialism uh, requires. Uh, and it's the same with NATO. Uh, like NATO is just an extension of, it's just, it's just for US foreign policy, but they like to pretend that it's not. So they involve lots of other countries. They've just made a Dutch guy uh, the, uh, the, the general secretary or secretary general or whatever they call of it. Uh, and the head of, of policy, and in particular nuclear policy, is British. And therefore, Britain does need nuclear weapons to justify that and to be this useful link in the chain of US imperialism. Um, <coughs> Trump obviously put all this in a very brash way when he said, you've all got to pay your way. But that is basically the attitude of the US ruling class, especially as the conflicts increase. They need their allies to spend more money on defense. So the US says 2%. The UK says, oh, we'll do 2.5%. That is also necessary, by the way, because... Um, the, the UK military is in an absolutely parlous state. It's in a terrible state. Um, <clears throat> the generals themselves have said very recently the army is about four times too small to actually fight a war. Uh, the Navy's fleet, ships are being retired faster than they can be replaced. And, it, and the Navy, for example, missed its recruitment target by 25% last year. There was a test fire of a Trident missile earlier this year. It was briefly in the news uh, and, and, and it failed. The last test fire of a Trident missile was 2016, and that also failed. The last successful test fire of a Trident missile was 2012. So they're spending hundreds of billions. To, they're renewing it at a cost of 205 billion pounds, the Trident uh, program. It doesn't even work properly. But they're spending all the money on that and nothing on the rest of it. They're spending all the money on that basically massive vanity project just to satisfy the interests of US imperialism. Meanwhile, the rest of the army is, that's where, well, that's where the defense budget goes, is on, is on Trident and they don't spend it on anything else. Um, there's also, there's another kind of, there's something else here that I can't develop in, in that much detail, but obviously if Trump wins in, in November, uh, he probably will try and pull the US out of Ukraine. And they are, that is kind of being priced into some of the calculations of the European uh, ruling class, who are saying Europe's gonna have to carry on this war without the US which is obviously going to be very expensive. And Europe is not equipped militarily to do that. And so they're starting to think a little bit about that uh, with one eye on what happens in the United States. Um, <coughs> uh, but all of this is basically why there is a bit of a banging, uh, and in, uh, a banging of increasing volume of the military drum at the moment. It's not just a random idea that they've had. Even this, this stupid thing that the Tories came out with about national service during the election, it wasn't just a brain fart. It, they clearly have been thinking about this, and it's certainly even more being pushed in other like Scandinavian countries and so on. Um, <clears throat> it, it is the inevitable product of imperialism today, of the position that Britain occupies in that imperialist chain, uh, and, and of the world situation. And this is happening, not coincidentally, at the same time that public services are crumbling. It's not coincidental because it is all the same, it's all the product of the same capitalist crisis. <coughs> and so this, uh, thanks. This throws that crisis into very sharp relief by comparing these, uh, these two things, the crumbling of public services at the same time as the proposed massive investment in the military. 
And on page five of the current issue of the paper, uh, there's a really good list of all the things that could, that the money being spent on defense and, and weapons, all the things that could be used for instead, schools and hospitals and so on. And these are very good agitational points which link these questions of foreign policy with class questions at home. And I would say that this is, is now and will be in people's consciousness more than ever before because of these processes and these trends that are taking place in the world, because of the situation, for example, in Gaza, in Palestine. Why we noticed that in Fiona's election campaign, why lo loads of people knocking on the door saying they can spend loads of money on Ukraine or, uh, or backing up Israel or whatever, but there's no money for, uh, for my house or for, or for benefits or for the NHS or whatever else. And that's, this is the context in which we're thinking about launching, or we have come up with this idea of launching a, a bit of a campaign around this question. Uh, it's books, not bombs. It's the that's a transitional slogan. It's the transitional method applied today. We had a really good discussion on that a couple of days ago, and comrades should make sure they read the transitional program. Because it gets people questioning, well, why is this the case? Yeah, why, why are they spending money on bombs and not books? Obviously, we'll explain. It's not just a choice. It's not just something they've sat down and thought we could do this, but actually we'll do that. It's the inevitable product of capitalism, imperialism, and the situation uh, in the world at the moment. And obviously that slogan directs the fire against our own ruling class and saying you are the imperialist gangsters that we're going to bring down. You want to tackle imperialism, you fight it at home and you, you attack your own ruling class. It also, it, ta it can also tackle this, the, the immigration issue right now, for example. One of the main things we should say about People who say, oh, the country's full and this and that. One of the main political arguments we would make is if you don't want people fleeing conflict abroad, then don't fund conflict abroad. Don't, don't, don't act in an imperialist way, but don't drop bombs on it or back up the US as it's dropping bombs. Um, <clears throat> so you can connect it with that. It also is a, a very good slogan and idea um, <clears throat> for tackling questions of like pacifism and reformism. The idea that we can just change people's minds by kind of convincing them or, or uh, condemning war and saying this is a bad thing as if it's just a choice basically that has been made. This is the, the, what we want to do here is, is, is go on the offensive against pacifism. This is not, and, and, and reformism. Oh, if we can, is, that is reform. Pacifism is reformism. It's the same, I, the same argument underpins both, which is if we can just convince them to do something a bit different, put a bit of pressure on, they'll do something a bit different. But it is so heavy. That's why I spent so long on like on the British economy and how it. It's completely embedded. They brought down Liz. They brought down the entire government, elected government, because it threatened this this setup that they've got. You can, you are not going to convince these people. You're not going to convince the city of London, the insurance companies, everything else, to sacrifice everything they've built. It is the, it's the only way that they can exist. It's completely embedded and it is totally tied up with the export of capital with imperialism. <laughs> it's tied to the US and so on and, and therefore supports it militarily. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think it, it covers a lot, of, a lot of the main points that we would want to hit basically in a, in a propaganda campaign. Uh, and it brings out a lot of, a lot of useful uh, points. Crucially, I would say <clears throat> that it, what, what this idea of books, not bombs explained in this way um, and linking foreign policy with, with like class or imperialism with, with domestic class uh, questions is that it says that the way to fight imperialism is not just A to B marches, nor just direct action. Those things are, are fine, like they are a valid part of, of a campaign and of a struggle. But on their own, they're not gonna, they are not gonna solve that problem, given, it, given the context and everything else we've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that can make a difference is, is, work, is organized working class action, basically. It's, it's class struggle methods that can actually fight this. And Books Not Bombs is basically saying that the struggle for decent wages, for proper investment in the NHS, for example, um, <clears throat> for good housing, that is the struggle against imperialism. If you're fighting for those things, if you're fighting for books and not bombs, that is also the struggle against it. It links those things together. The struggle against imperialism is a class struggle. It's, part of, it's a class question. It's not some pacifist thing. It's not something where you can just convince people of it and so on. It's not something that just demos on their own will do anything. It, it's, you've got to have organized class struggle. Uh, and, and there's a lot of good lessons in this book by Lenin on uh, these extracts from Lenin on imperialism and wars. I've got a lot of good lessons from that point of view in there as well.
So that's worth a read. But the, th the, point, the point that we're trying to get across here, I think, is that the slogans, books, not bombs, and so on, the tactics, how we present ourselves on the question of imperialism, when we're giving our speeches and on demonstrations, all of it flows from our understanding of capitalism, a deep understanding of, of the capitalist system and how it functions and how imperialism works and what the perspectives are. Understanding of the history of British capitalism and the perspectives for its future. If we can grasp all of that and if we can get the comrades in our branches to grasp all of these political ideas, then we can have a very effective campaign. We will not have an effective campaign if we just go back and say, Books, not bombs. As if that's as if that's ev that's that's the kind of that's the icing on the top, the cherry on the top. But you have to have all this other stuff to really have a good like. If you want to give a good speech, give good advice to campaigns and to to other people, and explaining what we're doing and what we're trying to achieve and so on, you have to have all of that political understanding, and that requires a lot of discussion in branches, your own reading and education and so on. So um, <clears throat> the main takeaways from this, then, what I've tried to cover is. The perspective is of rising imperialist conflicts around the world. That Britain is a key link in the chain of Western imperialism based on the export of finance capital. That militarism, British militarism and militarism in general, is the direct product of capitalist development. It's not just Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak having a bad day and thinking, yeah, let's, let's be a bit militaristic. It's the inevitable product of this situation. And all of this is only going to intensify in the future. And that the best way to fight imperialism and militarism is to fight our own ruling class through class struggle methods. These are the main points to take away from today.